Now that Castlevania has wrapped up its final season, I thought I'd look back on the series as a whole. I should mention up front, although they're calling season 4 the last, the producers have openly discussed how they plan on telling more stories in the Castlevania world. So I think it's pretty much a guarantee there is more Castlevania on the way, likely just focused on other characters. But today, we'll be looking at the existing four seasons, and as a complete story, what worked, what didn't, and what did I think of it overall. First, I have to credit this series with being my gateway into anime. Up until I saw Castlevania, my understanding of anime basically went as far as the little bits of Dragon Ball Z I caught on Cartoon Network in middle school. I assumed that like most animation, it was geared towards children. Then I saw this. And this. Definitely not for kids. Castlevania taught me the value of animation by telling a story with mature themes that could never work, especially not as a series in live action. Even putting aside the insane visuals when it comes to the supernatural elements, there isn't a stuntman on earth that could pull off Trevor's acrobatics with the Morningstar, especially not on a TV series budget. The fact is, animation opens the door to a treasure trove or Trevor Trove, of stories that would be impossible to tell, especially in series form, if you limit yourself to live action. And sadly, at least in America, animation has been off limits to adult storytelling, with comedy as the exception. But as pretty much everyone besides me was already aware, that is not the case in Japan. Sure, there are plenty of anime geared towards children, but there are also plenty tackling adult subject matter, and Castlevania, produced in America, is certainly not the first. So after devouring the measly four episodes of season one, I went hunting for more animated series, telling stories liberated from the limitations of live action, and now, four years later, more than 90% of what I watch is anime. Anyway, I'll get back to talking about Castlevania in a moment, but I thought this was worth bringing up because I doubt I'm the only one who had this experience. So I wanted to make sure I credited Castlevania with hopefully opening the door to more of this form of storytelling here in the US. Okay, back to Castlevania. First, quick warning if you haven't seen the show yet, there will be plenty of spoilers in this video. For the next few minutes, I'll stick with pretty light spoilers and will warn you before I dive into deep spoilers to discuss the story and ending. Okay, now for real, back to Castlevania. The first thing I noticed about this show when it released in 2017 was that it is a cool show. Within the first few minutes, we're introduced to the idea that Dracula is a reclusive scientist who combined magic and technology to create a teleporting castle. As a sci-fi fantasy and horror fan, seeing all three seamlessly combined so quickly was just awesome. And this sense of discovery continues throughout the series. Just about every episode gives another small bit of world building that makes the universe of Castlevania feel like a real place that you want to explore further. To name a few other examples, there's this scene in Season 2 where Sypha describes Enochian as the language all others originated from. Her knowledge of the occult language is what allowed her to open the gate to the Belmont Hold. And this is just one instance of many where the show hints at the exact logistics and mechanics of the magic which runs their world. Another great example of world building is this scene in Season 3, where Hector reads a vampire book and is fascinated to see discussion of vampire philosophy. He realizes that these creatures actually have their own culture, separate from humanities. These little bits of world building are such an important part of the show that help to elevate it beyond just horror action. So circling back to what I said about my first impression of the show being cool, that's what I meant. If you're part of that small slice of the human population that loves a genre mashing of sci-fi and horror, this show expertly scratches that long neglected itch. The next thing about Castlevania that came as a breath of fresh air is its villains. More than any other film or series I've seen in recent memory, I found that I could sympathize with and understand the villain's motivations. Watching the bishop burn Lisa Tepish at the stake, I felt Dracula's rage. 
Now, he took things a little farther than I probably would have, but I could understand his initial motivation. He was understandably angry and took out his rage on the entire human race. It's not a logical decision. It's an emotional one. And the scary thing is, unlike your average human, when Dracula has the thought, F it, I hope everyone dies, he has the power and influence to actually make it happen. As an example of a well-known villain that didn't work quite as well for me, look at Thanos. Rather than emotion, he is a villain that likes to believe he functions on logic. The problem with a villain that purports to be logical is that you can start to reason with them in your mind. Like, Thanos, you're telling me that in this world of gems that let you control reality, and nanotechnology that lets you materialize Iron Man suits out of thin air, there's no way we can create enough resources to sustain more than 50% of the population? I'm not really buying it. Not to go on a tangent, but in the comics, Thanos' motivation was a little different. He was in love with death, and to impress her, he kills half of all living beings. As far as villainous motivations go, that one actually works better for me personally than the one we saw on screen, because there is no logical argument for taking over or destroying the world. You don't become a villain for rational reasons. You do it for emotional reasons. In the case of comic Thanos and Castlevania Dracula, that emotion is love. And in Dracula's case, the rage that follows when your love is taken away. As opposed to movie Thanos, that logic's a little harder to argue with. Dracula, you really shouldn't kill innocent people. I don't care, I'm mad. Or as Dracula put it, There are no innocents, not anymore. You can't really argue with that. Through at least the first two seasons, I loved Castlevania's handling of its villains. Dracula, Hector, and Isaac felt like fleshed out characters with real motivations besides mustache twirling villainy. Once you get into the second half of the series, the villains didn't work quite as well for me, Carmilla in particular. By season 4, she does spell out her motivations pretty explicitly to Lenore, but in Dracula's case, we saw his motivations, and showing always works better than telling. So, the show is cool, it has mostly great villains, and somehow I've gotten this far into the review without talking about one of the show's main draws, the action. The fight scenes in this show are some of the best I've seen. First off, even though the series is animated, the action has a sense of realism to it, like the characters and weapons have real weight behind them. When Trevor takes a punch, you feel like you're watching someone take a punch. When he throws his morning star, every twist and turn of the whip feels like some version of physics is at work. When Saifa, Trevor, or Alucard impale a particularly nasty creature with an icicle, dagger, or sword, it truly feels satisfying. Also, thanks to the myriad of creature designs, along with the array of magical and physical abilities, every fight scene feels novel. We rarely see Trevor fight the same foe twice, so the fight scenes never become boring. We are constantly seeing Trevor and Sypha combine their abilities in unique ways to defeat whatever foe they're facing. The only complaint I have about the fight sequences is that sometimes the rules can become a little unclear. For example, we see Alucard has super speed, and we see that he can maneuver his sword with magic, so even if restrained, he can kill. So if I'm thinking a little too hard, then sometimes, when I watch Alucard physically straining himself in hand-to-hand -hand combat, I want to say, dude, just sit back and magic your sword to cut the guy in half. Stop working so hard. You get the same issue with Sypha, where she'll occasionally take out a few monsters at once with some impressive magic and it's hard not to wonder why she doesn't use abilities like that more often. I usually didn't find this to be too distracting, but especially in the last two or three episodes, it became a little harder to ignore. There was so much action in those last few episodes, so in the span of only a few minutes, you might see one of these abilities on display, and then minutes later wonder why they're not using it again. Anyway, it's not a major complaint, and one that could easily be solved with a few one-liners like, Wow, that move used up all my mana, won't be able to do that one again for a while. Or something hopefully more elegant than that. One more thing I'd mention about the fight scenes is that they show real progression. One risk that a lot of fight scenes succumb to is that they'll just have two people punch each other over and over, and then one side loses. 
in better fight scenes, like the ones in Castlevania, we see both sides take damage. They compensate for their wounds. They get tired, and ultimately, one side edges out a victory. This progression adds to the sense of realism and satisfaction when our heroes persevere. Okay, so I've said a lot of great things about aspects of the show and its style. What about the story? This is where I think the show suffers a little. That's not to say it's bad, but where a lot of what I've talked about so far I'd call great, the story I'd say is more like fine or good. There were definitely moments of greatness, but I think it was a little uneven and oddly paced when you take it season by season. By the way, this is where I start getting into spoilers. So I'll give you three seconds to bounce if you haven't seen the show and plan on watching it. And I'll use those three seconds to remind you, if you want a refresher on the series, check out my detailed seasons one through three recap by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Okay, on with the review. The first season was a little odd in that it was so short and felt entirely like setup. It felt more like season zero than season one, but in terms of setup, it was great setup. I already complimented the groundwork they laid for Dracula, again, excellent villain, and showing how he turned on humanity in that first episode was perfectly executed. What about the protagonists? Honestly, I find them less interesting than the villains, but I don't necessarily mind that. Like Batman, being on the side of good usually means you have some steadfast principles you stick to, which sometimes just isn't as interesting as the moral gray areas you reside in as a villain or antihero. So putting interesting aside, I liked the protagonists and the voice performances behind them. Trevor, Sypha, and Alucard are all likable in their own way, and the antics between them made for great levity that is sorely needed in the bleak world of Castlevania. Having said that, there were aspects of their personalities or backstory that I think would have been interesting to explore further. For example, Trevor was shown to be totally apathetic at the start of the series. So much so, he was willing to watch everyone in Greshit die without lifting a finger to help them. So, what are your plans? Find some more food, find some drink, get drunk, eat some food, move on. Maybe find a tall tree, sit in it, watch the show before I move on. All the good little people dying horribly, all that. However, he very quickly decides to take up arms and embrace the Belmont Creed to fight the darkness that threatens humanity. It was emotionally satisfying to watch this transformation, but I can't help but wonder what it would have looked like if Castlevania took its time with Trevor a little more. As it stands, it'd be hard for me to point at exactly what caused Trevor to change his mind after years of living as a drunk. Was it just hearing some wise words from an elder and firsthand witnessing the corruption of the church? Personally, it didn't feel like quite enough for me, or at least feels like a missed opportunity to spend more time on that transformation. Similarly, the character dynamics between Trevor, Sypha, and Alucard progressed pretty much exactly as they were telegraphed early on. Alucard and Trevor are frenemies that you know will become allies and true friends. Sypha is disgusted by Trevor, but you know she'll make him a better man and they'll fall in love, etc. You could have predicted all of that in Season 1, and that's exactly how it panned out. Again, it's not exactly a complaint because I enjoyed watching it happen. Just like knowing Jim and Pam will end up together didn't make it less satisfying when they finally did. But some surprises along the way would have been nice, especially when the protagonists are already outshined by the antagonists in terms of being interesting and in terms of transforming as people along their journeys. Returning to the overall season-by-season -season arc of the show, like I said, season one was great setup, especially for Dracula. Then season two upped the ante. It introduced a cast of characters that made the dynamics on the villain side even more interesting, with Carmilla, Hector, Isaac, and Godbrand. Hector and Isaac were especially fun to watch. One of the best things a story can do is make you wonder, and the moment these characters are introduced, you do exactly that. The moment I saw two humans in Dracula's war court, I couldn't wait to find out what that's all about. How do two humans reconcile with planning the genocide of their own species? I was immediately captivated by them, and especially when it came to Hector, enjoyed the conflict of feeling bad for him while simultaneously hating him. I felt bad as both Carmilla and Dracula manipulated him, but I also hated him for aiding and abetting in the slaughter of innocent people. 
On the protagonist side, like I mentioned already, things were a tad less interesting. Not just in terms of the characters' growth and evolution, but also just in their actions. On the villain side, we had a season of betrayals, changing loyalties, characters being forced to question what they're fighting for. Fun stuff. On the protagonist side, we watched people go to a library. Thrilling stuff. Of course, I'm oversimplifying, but looking back on season two, it really did not feel like Trevor, Sypha, and Alucard did a whole lot. Still, like I said, the series had moments of greatness, and ultimately that's where the Belmont hold led. Once Sypha pulled Dracula's castle to them, and we got the face-off against Dracula, things kicked into high gear, and we saw some great storytelling. First, the action was, as always, excellent, especially once the fight devolved into a one-on-one -on -one match between Alucard and his father. It was a fantastic, dynamic battle with some iconic moments. Just look at this. This room bathed in red moonlight as a father brutalizes his own son. Then the action fades into the background, and we get an incredibly emotional and powerful moment when Dracula becomes lucid. He realizes he's thrown Alucard against his childhood bed. He realizes he's killing his own son, and the look on his face is beautiful. The terror and sadness when he finally understands what he is doing. Probably the greatest moment of the series. And in terms of hero-villain battles, it set the bar so high, I don't think the series was able to reach it again. Sure, there were some incredible battles after that, and some of them certainly outshined this one in terms of visuals and just pure awesomeness, but in my opinion, none of them carried the emotional weight of Alucard versus Dracula. So to recap, Season 1 was a great prologue. Season 2 was excellent on the villain side, a little less so on the hero side, but ultimately led to a fantastic climax with the Alucard-Dracula battle. Then we get to Season 3, which was sadly my least favorite of the series. My main issue with it was, again, the heroes not doing a whole lot, and their journey being pretty predictable from the beginning. First, let's talk about Trevor and Sypha. They find themselves in Lindenfeld, and the key words there are, find themselves. Once again, they're fairly inactive here, wandering around and just happening into an adventure. Within the first minutes of their arrival, it becomes clear something strange is going on. The monks of the town are doing something weird at the Priory, and once the judge learns who Trevor and Sypha are, he asks if they can investigate what is going on. The first issue is that it's pretty predictable, at least generally, what they're up to. They're trying to bring Dracula back. As an audience, it felt like of course that's what they're doing, so watching Trevor and Sypha putz around town, picking up little hints here and there, I grew a little impatient. Also, their investigative skills ultimately led to Screw it, let's just bust the doors down and see what the hell is going on in the Priory. So it felt like a lot of treading water just to get where we ultimately knew we were going to end up. There was some cool stuff along the way, like the infinite corridor and the idea of a creature consuming souls in order to open it. Also, it was pretty damn cool to see Dracula and Lisa in hell. Alucard's story was similarly frustrating in that it felt like treading water so we could get to an ending we knew was coming. He's hanging out at his castle when two vampire hunters, Sumi and Taka, show up at his door asking to be trained. Maybe I've just seen too many movies, but the moment he agreed to train them, I knew they're going to turn on him. That becomes especially clear when they become impatient with Alucard withholding information. So I again became impatient watching 9 episodes, just waiting for an ending that I felt pretty certain was coming. I might have been more forgiving of this if it led to some important character transformation for Alucard, but even though it was hinted at, I don't think that really happened. The season ends with Alucard putting Sumi and Taka on sticks in front of his castle, exactly like his father, hinting that he may be starting to distrust humanity just like Dracula. But ultimately, as we see in Season 4, it doesn't take long for Alucard to get back to being a hero. So in hindsight, it feels more like they just weren't sure what to do with Alucard in Season 3. Over on the villain side, where they shined in Season 2, I thought they lagged a little in Season 3 as well. Carmilla, Striga, and Morana just did not earn the same emotional investment that Dracula did. So right off the bat, Carmilla is less interesting to watch when she's not in direct conflict with Dracula. Further, it felt like a lot of setup. We spent the season watching Carmilla prepare for a war, then the season ended before the war began. 
That may have been fine, but we at least needed some kind of emotionally satisfying climax. In Season 2, everything led up to Alucard vs. Dracula. In Season 3, it all led up to Trevor and Sypha vs. a nameless night creature. Don't get me wrong, it was a great battle, but it wasn't personal. It felt more like slaying a villain of the week. There was also Lenore turning Hector into her slave. Some of that was enjoyable because we got to see a vampire acting different than any other vampire we'd previously seen. But it once again felt like we know where this is going. Let's get to the point. Lenore was clearly manipulating Hector from the start, and finally, at the end of the season, Hector ends up with the slave ring on his finger. To me, the most interesting story in Season 3 was Isaac's. Once freed from serving Dracula, even though he did so willingly, Isaac's next steps were pretty unclear. So I was curious to see where he'd go, and the story did not disappoint. Similar to Dracula, Isaac's villainy is born from an emotional place. He was horribly mistreated, and is unable to hone his anger any further than at the entire human race. But unlike Dracula, we actually get to see his ideas challenged. I was fascinated when, early in the season, a ship captain explained the flaws in Isaac's master plan, pointing out how, yes, you can wipe out human cruelty through genocide, but in doing so, you also wipe out human kindness. It's a simple point, but I was on the edge of my seat waiting to see how Isaac, steadfast in his desire to end the race, would respond to it. I was on the edge of my seat again later in the season when Isaac speaks to one of his night creatures. This was a fascinating conversation. Up to that point, night creatures were mindless beasts from hell. If one of them could speak, what would they say? Throughout the season, I watched Isaac with a close eye because he was the character that showed the most potential for change, something which would be fully realized in Season 4. Speaking of which, Season 4, the final season, how did it all wrap up? Did they stick the landing? I definitely think it was an improvement over Season 3. Similar to how Season 1 teed up a more exciting Season 2, Season 3 did the same for Season 4. Rejoining Trevor and Sypha, we find them growing weary over the weeks following their departure from Lindenfeld. Over and over, they find and prevent various people from resurrecting Dracula. Trevor's frankness in displaying his annoyance was very in character, and a great example of why he's so entertaining. This line here was particularly memorable. Why the fuck would anyone do that? Hmm? Would you do that? Oh, exactly. Also, as though hearing my complaints at how little the heroes actually do, Trevor finally grows frustrated and decides they need to be more proactive. They need to start helping people actually rebuild. I loved this development and thought it was a great way to gear up for the series finale. I also think it helps bring together a lot of what the show has to say thematically. I'll talk about that more later. Meanwhile, a town near Alucard's castle begs him for help in fending off night creatures. As I pointed out earlier, Season 3 seemed to set Alucard up as potentially taking after his father, but it didn't take much convincing for him to play hero for the small town. Before that though, there is the amusing realization that he's becoming Trevor Belmont. Once he joins forces with the town, we watch a relationship blossom between him and Greta. If there was any risk of Alucard losing touch with humanity, his relationship with her, whether it eventually turns romantic or not, and his communion with the town definitely brought him back. If I ignore Alucard's Season 3 arc, then I enjoyed the evolution of his character in Season 4. He's become the exact opposite of his father. Rather than a recluse in his castle, he's turned it and the Belmont Hold into a community where he is anything but alone. Further, he seems to have dedicated himself to the protection of humanity. Jumping over to the villain side, we see a lot of transformation with similarly mixed results when you consider where we were in Season 3. First, looking at Hector and Lenore, we find them in a very different situation than what we saw in Season 3. The end of Season 3 saw Hector falling to his knees, proclaiming that his life is over, with Lenore's slave ring on his finger. She laughs over him, saying she made him her pet. Hector seemed to be in a pretty precarious situation. Then, in Season 4, we find that things are not bad for him. At all. We knew that he'd have free reign of the castle, and would be kept comfortable, but the dynamic between him and Lenore changed considerably. It does not seem at all that she sees him as a pet, but instead seems to look at him as a confidant. At times, she even seems to look up to him. I definitely buy that their relationship could end up in this place, but it's such a significant shift from where we were last season, 
I really would have liked to see that change happen, rather than having the dynamic shift between seasons. But accepting that something happened between seasons we didn't get to see, I enjoyed what we did get to see from them in Season 4, hearing Lenore pontificate on the nature of vampires, and finding it incompatible with humanity's need to grow was pretty fascinating. Then watching her take those steps into the sunlight was another beautiful and memorable image from the series. On par with Dracula realizing he's murdering his own son. I also think it speaks to the larger themes of the show. Vampires represent our base desires to simply consume and survive. However, humans have an innate need to do more than that. With Dracula and Carmilla gone, and with Isaac now set on building the world rather than destroying it, humanity has been freed from those base desires. They can now focus on building and moving forward, something a vampire has no business doing. Lenore saw that and realized she has no place in the new world. She made her peace with it and gave herself up to the sunlight. I thought it was a masterful end to her arc, I think they just skipped a few steps in getting there. Speaking of Isaac, I felt his arc reached a satisfying conclusion as well. He always came off as an intelligent person, so I found it convincing that traveling the world would lead him to a reasonable conclusion, i.e. committing genocide on your own species is probably not the best path. The transformation was a little on the nose in that we literally saw Isaac talking to himself, explaining his entire character arc out loud. Like I said before, showing pretty much always works better than telling. Otherwise, I like where Isaac ended up, and we got a great showdown between him and Carmilla. Similar to Lenore's demise, this duel felt thematically appropriate. Isaac represents growth, while Carmilla represents consumption and regression. So they will, of course, have to fight, and wow, their battle was epic. Visually, the battleground alone was beautiful. The glowing blue room with the vibrant red pool of blood splashing as they fought. Further, I complimented the series on its ability to keep every fight novel. That was certainly true here as well. Isaac's night creature is seamlessly stepping into the fight to assist him throughout the battle is something I've never seen before. It was a great fight, an entertaining one, and a fitting end for Carmilla. By the way, I didn't talk a whole lot about Striga and Mirana. They had a nice ending which definitely put a smile on my face, but on the whole they felt oddly inconsequential. It seemed like we were gearing up for conflict between them and Carmilla, but never actually got it. Also, I have to shout out Striga's day armor, visually striking and just awesome. Now let's talk about the secret big bad of the series, death, actual literal death. And by the way, anytime someone pointed that out in pretty much those exact words, Definitely got a chuckle from me. Oh my god. That is actually death. What? That's supposed to be the Grim Reaper himself. That's what death looks like? Like as an audience, it's crazy that death is showing up. But in the reality of the show itself, it's just as crazy for them. So, how did I feel about the Trevor versus death battle? Visually awesome. I started off by saying this show is cool, and this entire sequence definitely embodies that. You have Death attempting to shove Dracula and his wife's souls into a hermaphroditic Frankenstein. Why? So Dracula will go completely insane and destroy the world, feeding Death with all the death he could ever want. That's just a crazy, awesome, completely insane way for the story to go. Then for Death itself, I thought it was one of the best designed incarnations of the character I've ever seen. The performance was also fantastic. I'll never forget the delivery of this line. Why is it that only human hands can reach into hell? Don't you think that's weirdly fucked up? So clearly, I viscerally enjoyed the whole battle. But while I enjoyed it, I also had one eyebrow raised at the fact that Trevor vs. Death as the climactic battle of the series felt a little random. Prior to Season 4, we had very little mention, if any, of Death as an actual being in their world. It felt a little like he was quickly introduced because we needed to find a way to up the ante from the Dracula battle, they needed a bigger bad, so with only a few episodes to go, Death showed up. And as I mentioned a few times already, the Alucard vs. Dracula battle carried so much dramatic weight because of all the groundwork leading up to it. We had essentially none of that for Death. Just a few lines from Trevor describing who Death is, so it all felt a little out of left field. True, it's revealed that Death was pulling some strings longer than we realized, 
But that's the risk you take when relying on a mystery like this. If Death's presence was revealed earlier in the season or series, we could engage with him as a villain like we did Dracula, and his battle with Trevor would have felt more organic. However, the show went for a twist, which means we only got to live with Death's presence briefly, and in my opinion, it was a little too brief to the point where it felt distractingly out of left field. Even in this moment, my heart was breaking as Trevor yelled to Sypha, Just remember, Trevor is a terrible name. That was a great way of telling us that Sypha is pregnant, and Trevor knows it, without actually saying it. It was a beautiful moment, but at the same time, I had that one eyebrow raised, thinking, wait, why does Trevor need to go sacrifice himself? I kept thinking I was missing something, but I don't think so. I think Trevor just saw he had an opportunity in that moment to kill Death, and he should take that chance while he has it. But it just felt odd, considering Death has been around since the beginning of time. I personally needed a little more reason to understand why here, why now. Not to beat a dead horse, it just felt a little out of nowhere. All that being said, once I got past that, it looked awesome and was as visually impressive as the series often is. Finally, the ending. In a show as bleak as this, was anyone expecting a happy, optimistic ending? I definitely was not, but was very pleasantly surprised when we got one. Trevor shocked everyone by surviving the battle, Sypha is pregnant, Alucard is no longer alone, Isaac is going to build a new world, Hector is going to write a book, Dracula and Lisa are alive. Though I'm sure there's an awkward conversation to be had between them on how Dracula spent his time after she died, but that's for another time. All in all, these characters went through a lot. We saw so much death and destruction, thematically it felt right we end on a positive, uplifting note. It felt earned to me, and I appreciated it. Speaking of death and destruction, by the way, something I didn't touch on much is the gore in this show. Some of the most violent images I've ever seen were in Castlevania. In fact, the only time I've ever been flagged for having a video potentially unsuitable for ads was in my Castlevania recap video where said gore was on full display. Just to comment on it briefly, I think the gore worked for this show. We needed to feel the unfairness and absolute brutality of the world to know what vampires are capable of and what our heroes are up against. The shocking images of dismembered women and children right from the start of the series express that in a way words never could. To wrap it all up, I'll conclude by saying I really like Castlevania, but I stopped just short of loving it. At its worst, I was a little bored or frustrated by the story while still enjoying my time with the characters and marveling at the visuals. At its best, I got the whole package. Great visuals, an engaging story, and something which carried real emotional weight. It combined some of my favorite genres, horror, fantasy, and sci-fi, though also included a surprising dose of comedy. And although I was disappointed by some missed opportunities in their development, I loved the characters we took this journey with. Trevor especially made for a great gateway into the world, often saying exactly what we were thinking. And I'm excited at the prospect of the series continuing in some form. Although it's unclear what it'll look like, it sounds like some kind of future series is all but guaranteed. I assume whatever it is, we'll follow a new set of characters, but I'd love for them to revisit some of these characters as well, even if it's just on the periphery of a new story. Anyway, let me know what you thought of the series. Were you satisfied with the ending? Whose arc was your favorite? And what are you hoping to see in a new series? Drop it in the comments and we'll keep the conversation going. I also have some more Castlevania videos on the way, so make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to keep up. With that, thanks for watching and see you on the next One Take.